planets of our solar system come in two varieties. The inner four, including Earth, are heavy, rocky cinders. Where the fifth should be, there's only a band of debris, the asteroid belt. Beyond ride the enormous outer four, the mysterious gas giants. Jupiter, largest member by far of the Sun's family. Monarch of the outer planets, a thousand times the size of Earth. Beautiful ring Saturn. Third of the gas giants, Uranus, rotating on its side. And finally, Neptune. In early 1972, mankind launched Pioneer 10, the first to venture out beyond the orbit of Mars, out through the Jupiter system, and eventually, out of our solar system completely. Our odyssey to the outer planets begins here at Cape Kennedy, a good omen under a mock Jupiter sunrise. The ungainly, pregnant Guppy delivers a special cargo. The Jupiter Pioneers were built by TRW Systems of Redondo Beach, California, under contract to NASA's Ames Research Center. The project involved some 25 million man-hours of meticulous work by the government, industry, university, pioneer team. Each marvelously compact and reliable spacecraft weighed less than 600 pounds, including some 65 pounds of scientific instruments. The 11 onboard sensors include five radiation and charged particle detectors, one magnetometer, and three light measuring devices. One for the visible spectrum, and one for either end of the visible ring, the infrared and the ultraviolet. There's also an experiment to look for asteroids, and one to measure the number of times Pioneer is struck by space dust. All of these devices together use less electricity than one 25-watt bulb. That's energy conservation. The question arises, what can 65 pounds of space-borne instruments tell us that Earth's finest facilities can't? For example, the famous Mount Palomar telescope with its 17-foot diameter glass eye. A scientist who uses both Pioneer and Palomar is Dr. Guido Munch of Caltech. We have used the 200-inch telescope extensively for planetary observations. This is the largest operating telescope that has ever been built. With this telescope, the planet Jupiter appears of the size of a 50-cent piece. The Pioneer infrared experiment with a 3-inch telescope, at the distance of closest approach, the planet will cover one-fifth of the sky. And this is the advantage that we get from the three-inch telescope to the ground base with the large telescope here. The second day of March, 1972, Pioneer 10 waits for launch atop a new three-stage version of the Atlas Centaur rocket.
Pioneer gets its electricity from small onboard atomic heat sources. At a half billion miles, the sun is too weak to power solar cells. The spacecraft spins five times a minute for stabilization. On ground command, small thrusters fire to maintain the spin rate and to keep the large dish antenna precisely pointed at the receding Earth. It's not easy to break out of the solar system. It requires enough speed to defeat the sun's gravity as well as Earth's gravity. Pioneer streaks away faster than any previous spacecraft, gulping distance at a million miles a day, passing the moon in just 11 hours. Still, Jupiter is nearly two years away. On the way out past Mars, the experiments are tested and calibrated. Their data add to mankind's understanding of the interplanetary climate of space. The asteroid belt, as some had imagined it. Before Pioneer 10, it was pictured as a region where great boulders grind together, creating a 40,000 mile per hour sandstorm. If so, it might have represented a perpetual barrier to outer planet flight. In fact, the pioneers found very little space dust in the asteroid belt. True, there are several thousand asteroids, some as big as Texas, but they should offer no menace to navigation. Thirteen months later, a sister spacecraft, Pioneer 11, left the pad on its long and chancy voyage to Jupiter and Saturn. NASA's Deep Space Network tracks the mission. So sensitive are these ears that they will hear Pioneer out to nearly two billion miles. Late November, 1973, Pioneer 10 closes in on Jupiter. Each hour brings the planet 20,000 miles closer. Pioneer is managed and controlled from Ames Research Center located at Mountain View, California, near San Francisco. The nerve center is in this building. The pioneers are run by men who send commands from Earth, not by automatic systems on board. This cuts complexity and cost. We're in the mission control area for Pioneer 10, and behind us is the mission control room. Now, right now, they're preparing to send a class two commands up to the spacecraft, merely to uh, change the attitude of one of the instruments, the operating mode, so that we can uh, look on Jupiter. The interesting feature here is that the uh, round-trip light time, the time to get a message from here up to the spacecraft, and then to get a return answer, is an hour and a half. So our people in there have to be used to this uh, uh, hour and a half delay when they start planning the mission. This is the planet Jupiter. It has a banded structure in its atmosphere. Uh, the present theory for this has to do with the fact that it's rotating very rapidly on its axis. It rotates more than twice in one day. One of the most prominent features as observed from Earth is what they call the Great Red Spot. The size of the spot is about equal to three Earth diameters. Uh, we just received a stand clear. During encounter, it's busy. 
For example, to command just the electronic camera that makes Perfect. pictures of Jupiter, Pioneer Control transmits some 15,000 commands in just two months. Arctic Command, I'll verify command stack loaded. Block message number nine. First command, IP Whiskey 2, time 141032, decimal 8. Roger, copy. We're enabling message stand at this time. In response to these commands, the camera scans Jupiter's turbulent cloud tops as Pioneer spins toward encounter. Because the spacecraft is moving at up to 80,000 miles per hour, and because Jupiter is rotating at 22,000 miles per hour, the scans do not immediately form a pretty picture. They must be decoded and corrected for distortion. First, the scans are built up line by line on a television display. This gives a quick look at the operation of the system and a tantalizing hint of the spectacular pictures buried in the raw data. After the first stage of prettying up, Jupiter's first close-up portrait emerges. Jupiter has an atmosphere rich in hydrogen and its compounds, the same kind of atmosphere that the Earth had at the time of the origin of life. By no means out of the question that there are forms of life in the clouds of Jupiter. And uh, indeed, if you viewed the solar system from afar, I think you could make an argument that life on Jupiter was more likely than life anywhere else, including on the Earth. Dr. Sagan also provided for Pioneer the famous picture postcard to extraterrestrial life. But in the remote contingency that there are interstellar spacefaring societies which might someday pick up this derelict no longer radioing, we thought we would put a message on it to indicate a little bit of where we are, when we are, and who we are. We think that the, the information on where we are and when we are indicated in this part of the message by the configuration of certain cosmic objects called pulsars will be completely obvious to uh, any society capable of traveling between the stars. These two objects will be more mysterious because it is unlikely that there will be human beings anywhere else, even though there may be other creatures elsewhere. And the fact has served a very useful purpose in making us think about what sort of impression we might wish to give to the cosmos. Each morning, the key scientific investigators and the key spacecraft personnel meet in the office of Pioneer Project Manager Charlie Hall for a stand-up meeting. I like a contrast, I guess, a bit over. I have the impression that it is all in the I don't know for sure that it is all in the picture. Yeah, yeah, with such accuracy, but just grossly, whether we can trust the angles on the I'm afraid to say anything because I don't know. Uh, say 250 degrees or something like that, system three, which is not far from what the radio astronomers inferred. We have three sets of accurate observations with the IPP this week since the last procession maneuver. Uh, what we're seeing here is that in both for both electrons and protons, we're seeing in first approximation an in-phase change. December 2nd, 1973. Tomorrow, Pioneer will make its closest pass of Jupiter, when this fantastic world will fill one-fifth of the sky. Today, Pioneer is being cooked by incredibly severe radiation, yet everything continues to work perfectly. This spectacular picture shows the shadow of the satellite Io, just as Dr. Kuiper's ground-based photo did. But from this distance, new details in the cloud bands become evident. Huge coiling storm areas larger than the Earth. Since launch, Pioneer has been slowing down. Now the pull of Jupiter's gravity speeds it up to a fantastic 82,000 miles per hour. In effect, this crack-the-whip left turn gives Pioneer another rocket stage to fling it out of the solar system. Unexpectedly, the space dust count soars a hundred times as many hits. December 3rd, Pioneer sweeps to within 81,000 miles of the cloud top. Now things happen fast. 
15 minutes after closest approach, the spacecraft is targeted to pass out of Earth's sight behind the orange moon Io for a critical two minutes. An hour later, Pioneer passes out of sight of both Earth and Sun, this time behind Jupiter. Back at mission control, they won't know what happened in space until 45 minutes later. The spacecraft is collecting its worst radiation exposure now. Tension is even greater this time. And so is the relief. Very good. We came out just uh, a little bit later than we expected to, about 40 seconds later than we expected to, but everything worked fine. We went in about 14 seconds later. All the instruments are operating just like they were when they uh, went in. We're very pleased. Gee, you're late again. It's pretty good for us by work, though. Makes it all worthwhile. The, after uh, 10 years of having to put up with all these people, uh, the 14 hours a day, it's all worthwhile. Now, Pioneer views a sight never before seen by man, the Crescent Jupiter. From Earth, we can see only its full phase, like a full moon. These lighting angles give scientists new information. On the television system, the images rapidly become smaller. Now, several consecutive pictures can be stored on the tube at once. Thanks to energy literally stolen from Jupiter, Pioneer 10 departs more than twice as fast as it arrives. After encounter, the data tapes for the imaging experiment go to the University of Arizona for computer enhancement. In a meticulous process, millions of data points are juggled up and down the scale. And what emerges is a portrait of Jupiter to challenge the most imaginative artist. Now the world wants to know, what have we learned? The scientists readily admit to newsmen that for each question answered, a hundred new ones have been raised. Some points are clear. The whole Jupiter system is heavier than we thought by about the weight of two Earth moons. Our most important finding to date... Io has a thin atmosphere. Thus, Jupiter's four large moons probably all have atmospheres. A compass on Jupiter would point to the South Pole instead of the North Pole. The infrared experiment successfully mapped Jupiter's heat in fine detail. The planet gives off more than twice as much heat as it receives from the Sun. Why? Possibly its enormous gravity makes it contract like a slow motion star. The white belts are cooler and therefore higher bands of clouds stretched around basically darker colored material below. Also, the night side and the day side appear the same temperature. Discoveries like these flash out to the world. To experimenters, some of the most interesting findings concern Jupiter's radiation belts and magnetic fields. Pioneer first broke into the magnetic field an incredible four million miles in front of the planet. Because of the pressure of the solar wind, this field streams out much farther behind Jupiter. Closer in, Pioneer indicates that Jupiter's intense radiation belts wobble up and down around a magnetic center some 10,000 miles from the center of the planet. In brief, Jupiter is much different from Earth and much more complex than researchers imagined. However, Pioneer proved that a spacecraft could survive the radiation. While Pioneer 10 journeys to the edge of the solar system and beyond, the information it returned has permitted Pioneer 11 to be redirected to not only pass closer by Jupiter, 
but to continue on to the next outer planet, Saturn. If all goes well, Pioneer 11 will reach the ring planet late in 1979. Year 11 was launched in 1973. It reached Jupiter in 1974, but because of the orientation of the planets in our solar system, it took another full five years to get from Jupiter over to Saturn. It's a billion miles from Earth to Saturn, but the total journey from Earth through Jupiter to Saturn was more than two billion miles. Pioneer Saturn mission continues to go very, very well. We're about 50 hours now from closest approach on Saturday morning. Scientists have been waiting several days to discover the existence of the magnetic field of Saturn. It was predicted as early as Tuesday of this week, but the solar wind, uh, several solar flares and gusts of wind in the past month have put an incredible number of charged ionized particles into space, directed out towards Saturn, and those particles have interfered, or did interfere, with Pioneer's instruments for detecting magnetic field. We felt that the interior of Saturn is such that Saturn would more than likely have a magnetic field, and yet the solar storm that we're encountering as we uh, are approaching Saturn is such that that magnetic field was masked, and so we kept getting closer and closer and closer to Saturn and no magnetic field. And uh, early this morning, we crossed the standing bow shock wave, which results as a, uh, as a consequence of, of that magnetic field and the impact of the solar wind, which immediately told us, yes, indeed, Saturn does have a magnetic field, and we were even able to compute what the strength of that field was. On uh, details on planet Saturn itself, there is uh, not much in the way of uh, spots, which is a bit disappointing 
because we had hoped to uh, get uh, precise uh, rotation rates and thereby a better information on uh, jets and streams in the atmosphere uh, of Saturn. The structure, however, of uh, belts and zones is uh, beginning to be seen and uh, looks somewhat different from that of uh, Jupiter, whereas from the Earth already uh, we knew that there uh, are in an hemisphere, say the northern hemisphere, which is the one that we're observing best right now, on the order of five uh, belts and five zones, so that was known from uh, ground-based uh, observations. It uh, now looks that there are many more of these bright zones and dark belts, uh, perhaps twice as many. Saturn has been called the most beautiful planet in the solar system, and uh, uh, perhaps this picture is a good example of why. The planet appears oblate. It is oblate, uh, the diameter quite a bit larger at the equator than it is down through the pole. Uh, this is the one you, that came in here at about 3 o'clock yesterday afternoon. This is our, by far the most spectacular picture uh, we have so far. This is raw data. It has not been processed in any way. Uh, we can see the, the big banded planet and, the, of course, the ring system is very prominent in this picture. Also prominent is uh, Saturn's largest moon, Titan, in the upper right-hand corner. Titan is 3,600 miles in diameter, uh, almost planet size. Now, Titan is particularly interesting because uh, it's one of the planets that has a reasonable atmosphere associated with it, and it contains at least methane, which we believe may have been one of the ingredients on some of the early, uh, in the early primitive Earth. And there are also indications, other indications, in the, in the atmosphere of Titan that there is organic chemistry going on. What kind of information will you be looking for to indicate some kind of life form on the moon Titan? Really none, but let me now modify that simple answer. The uh, question of life on Titan hinges on a number of factors, but mainly the temperature of the surface of Titan. If it's warm, such as above the freezing point of water, then we could say that there's a possibility of life on Titan. Unfortunately, we can't see through clouds. So if there are a lot of clouds in the atmosphere, we're just going to see the cold cloud tops. I have some hope that we will be able to say whether Titan has a thick atmosphere or a thin atmosphere. If it has a thick one, then there's hopes that below the clouds, there's a gradually rising temperature and ultimately a warm temperature at the ground. Actually, there have been some radio observations rather recently that uh, show that the temperature at the surface is cold, not all that different from the temperature at the cloud tops. And this isn't uh, sort of a suggestion that really the atmosphere isn't all that thick cloud tops are not all that far above the surface and therefore uh, the atmosphere is thin, sort of a Mars-like atmosphere. Does that throw both a greenhouse and a inversion atmosphere model out the window? Well, it, thin. these observations, these radio observations will throw out the greenhouse model. They tend to throw them sort out and they tend to throw out the possibility of life if there ever was one because Titan is therefore much too cold. The uh, spacecraft has now moved to within 700,000 miles of uh, the planet Saturn, and it's moving closer at uh, just about 26,000 miles per hour. Uh, this first view is, is a close-up view of the equatorial region of Saturn. Uh, I think it's very interesting and has caused quite a bit of comment uh, here in the Mission Operations Center. And the stripes that we see to the left are a back-lighted view of Saturn's rings. But the most interesting thing, perhaps, is the shadow these rings cast on the surface or the cloud tops at Saturn. At 7.36 a.m. this morning, the spacecraft will pass through the ring plane at Saturn, and this is probably the most dangerous part of its journey. 
even though the spacecraft is going by Saturn outside of the three visible rings, they're the three rings that we can see from Earth, scientists are quite sure that there is a great deal of material which lies outside of the outermost visible ring, the so-called A-ring. Well, Pioneer Saturn is going to be going through that, and uh, it will take less than a second for it to uh, penetrate the, the ring and move through it. But if it should encounter a piece of debris, uh, it could be the end of the mission right there. Time is 9.03 and 40 seconds right now, 20 more seconds, and uh, we will be able to confirm the spacecraft has survived. 15 seconds, 10 seconds, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. This. We have a mission. The Pioneer Saturn spacecraft has survived the crossing of the ring plane. Our micrometeoroid detector on the spacecraft received two hits. Uh, now that is the maximum number of hits it can achieve in an 80 minute period. So it could have been a, quite a few more hits than two. So uh, there's no question we did go through a, a region that has some debris in it. We successfully traversed across the ring plane through the, the unknown E-ring, as Charlie Hall indicated a minute ago, we did see some evidence of an E-ring in the form of uh, two hits on our micrometeoroid detectors. These detectors were, were not made to measure this type of thing. They were made to uh, make these measurements out in interplanetary space. Uh, two hits is the maximum that we can count in any one 80-minute uh, period, uh, just by the nature of the way the instrument is built. So we know there is material in the E-ring, uh, but we also know that uh, uh, the spacecraft survived that E-ring with no apparent damage at this point. The, the hits that occurred on the uh, meteoroid detectors occurred about 10 minutes before the expected ring plane crossing, which would uh, mean that the are a little bit thicker than we had expected but this has to be confirmed yet i don't know exactly when the ring plane crossing is was and we won't know that until the occultation data comes in so we'll have to go back and recalculate but it might have been as much as a thousand kilometers above the uh, ring plane that the penetrations occurred uh, we don't know how many cells were lost a good check will probably be when we go through the ring plane on the way back out because the detectors should be armed again ready to detect meteoroid penetrations at the on the outbound crossing. The particles uh, were approaching the spacecraft at 17 kilometers per second and they were approaching from a direction about 40 degrees off of the spin axis from this side here. So they the detectors were in a very good location to receive the impacts. How large a particle would it take to damage the uh, spacecraft? Um, I'm, I'm talking about 10 micron particles, certainly bigger than 100 microns, maybe uh, somewhere between 100 microns and a millimeter. You said you had 234 cells. Is that how many you had left at the start of well, when you No, had that, was the that, that was the initial. That was the initial. About half of them were left at the time. The so encounter. You had like 120 hits from launch until now. Yeah. Frequency is more like uh, one a month or every two months. Very low frequency. In, in terms of the trajectory, um, going what, what it just did going through the, the plane, is it coming out the same uh, at the same point within that ring or closer to the planet? Or? It's going to be slightly farther out. It uh, it's going to be slightly farther. I believe it came in in about. Uh, 2.6 or 2.8 Saturn radii, and it's going out a little over three, but it's essentially uh, symmetric. That was Donald Humes of the Langsley Research Center. Donald Humes worked on the micrometeoroid experiment. That was the experiment that did detect, to its maximum capability, small meteoroids of size 10 microns to 100 microns as Pioneer 11 went through the area outside the visible rings. You keep on hearing words, phrases like A-ring and E-ring. A-ring is the visible outer ring that we know of for sure right now. 
The E-ring is a suspected area of particles that's outside that visible area. Uh, it's the area that Pioneer 11 flew through as it went by the plane of the rings early this morning, and it will pass again on its way out. As Charles Hall, the Pioneer mission manager, stated before, there is material in the E-rings. We, many scientists have suspected it, and we now know there is. Luckily for Pioneer 11, however, uh, its micrometeoroid detector picked up only what appeared to be very, very small particles. Uh, they'd have to be small at the speeds that Pioneer 11 is accelerating to now, uh, even hitting a pebble-sized fragment in, the, in orbit in the rings outside Saturn uh, could be devastating. It could be fatal. Now, as Charles Hall pointed out, getting through the rings uh, means not only going under them the first time to get to closest encounter, but it also means coming back out through the E-ring. Uh, that's going to be happening a little bit later. We should say that early in the week, some of the experiments using light uh, gave scientists a first look at Saturn's ninth moon, Iapetus, uh, and encouraged them to believe that Iapetus has a very unusual structure, perhaps. Uh, as you may know, Iapetus is very dark on one side and yet very light on the other. The two faces are very, very different. The re reflectivity is very, very different from one side to the other. And scientists are looking at it, to, to believing that the light side of the satellite Iapetus may be covered with ice, whereas the dark side is covered by rock or dust. What we've shown here is a, the Pioneer Rock, uh, which we uh, presume lies in or near the ring plane. This is the Pioneer spacecraft, which at this time was about 10 minutes after having crossed the ring plane and was moving inward towards periapsis. It seems clear that uh, <clears throat> referring to this as a Pioneer rock was perhaps somewhat misleading. As you've heard, the energetic particles have given us some idea about the size of this thing, which uh, we nearly missed. And uh, several hundred kilometers is probably more comparable in cross-section to the greater San Francisco, Oakland area. So uh, calling it a rock is perhaps not really the appropriate thing. As far as we know, what wasn't there, we went under it about 10 minutes after crossing the ring plane. And I would say, along with the others, that we were damn lucky. <laughs> from the spacecraft uh, indicates an absolutely healthy spacecraft in every respect. At uh, 9.27, uh, about 30 seconds from now, the spacecraft will pass by the Saturn moon Mimas at its closest approach point. Mimas orbits at 78,300 miles from Saturn and is a relatively small moon, some 585 miles in diameter. At 9.31, uh, the spacecraft will pass by Saturn at its closest point, some little over 13,000 miles above the Saturn cloud tops. Uh, once again, we're in that position of waiting an hour and 26 minutes for the telemetry from that closest approach to reach Earth. We don't have the concern uh, uh, this time that we had for the ring plane crossing. Uh, uh, I, don't, I don't believe anybody thinks that there's any real danger to uh, the spacecraft at this point. We will be passing into the sun shadow very shortly and passing behind the, the planet uh, so that the spacecraft is, communications with the spacecraft will be cut off from our Earth tracking station. We don't anticipate any problems with that. There will be a 78-minute period when uh, the spacecraft will be out of view of our Earth tracking stations, but it will be in the so-called format B, uh, where uh, the spacecraft will be storing information on board. When it comes out from, the, from behind the planet, it will uh, uh, relay then that information uh, from the experiments that it gathered while it was uh, behind the planet. So we're moving right up to that point of closest approach. 
on the right. The spacecraft, of course, will be behind the planet then for about 78 minutes. And then uh, it will come up from the other side of the spacecraft, still beneath the ring plane. And, but we will once again be able to establish communication. Now, it's interesting that the, the spacecraft will be behind the planet. But uh, for our purposes here on Earth, we're an hour and 26 minutes behind this whole operation. So actually, while the spacecraft is behind the planet, we'll be receiving signals from it. And when it comes out to the other side and is once again in view, we'll be in radio silence. The time now is 9.30, a minute away from closest approach. The spacecraft has accelerated to the unbelievable speed of about 72,000 miles per hour. We're 13,300 miles above the cloud top. And the spacecraft is just skimming uh, behind Saturn, below the ring plane, and will disappear uh, behind the, the planet in just a few minutes. 931, the spacecraft is now at its closest point to the planet Saturn, traveling at 72,000 miles per hour and a little over 13,000 miles directly above the cloud top. The spacecraft now behind the planet Saturn. We're still re receiving telemetry and uh, will for uh, the period of time that it takes it to signal uh, to reach the Earth from the spacecraft. The telemetry loss will occur at 10.58 Pacific time. Uh, and that's uh, about an hour and a half after the, the spacecraft goes behind the planet. But our blackout on Earth, that is the time when we will not be receiving telemetry from the spacecraft, will be from 10.58 to 12.16. The time is now 9.54. Uh, the next next event on the schedule uh, is not until 10.50 when the, when the spacecraft will come out from behind the planet Saturn, be commanded back into uh, normal operation. Uh, it will, uh, first of all, read out a, from a tape recorder on board the data that it gathered as it was behind the uh, planet. It will be storing uh, science data at the rate of 16 bits per second. Uh, immediately after the spacecraft comes out from behind the planet, uh, the, that stored data will be read out, and then we'll go back into the normal encounter mode. The uh, imaging experiment uh, will resume operation, and uh, we'll continue this uh, flyby of Saturn. We have one more uh, uh, rather dangerous ring crossing ahead of us. Uh, I think the mood here is uh, uh, they're rather confident that uh, this spacecraft is indestructible. As Charlie Hall put it a while ago, it's, it was, uh, luck has played a big role in this program so far and uh, seems to be still riding on the shoulders of uh, the project manager and, and his people. Uh, this outbound crossing will occur at 11.32 a.m. Pacific time. And at that point, the spacecraft will be 78,000 miles away from the cloud top of Saturn. And receivers reported out of lock. Receivers are out of lock. We no longer have communications with the spacecraft. Project scientist uh, John Wolf has estimated that the chances of getting through the ring plane are 50-50. And uh, as Charlie Hall indicated a while ago, we perhaps used up the 150 and we hope the other one isn't waiting for us. So at uh, 9.43 and about an hour and 14 minutes until receipt of uh, closest approach data. This is Pioneer Saturn mission operation. Pioneer is now collecting its data as it goes through its so-called occultation period.
That's the period of radio blackout. It's when Saturn blocks out signals from Pioneer 11 back to the Earth tracking stations. Uh, probably should say a few words about those. The Earth tracking stations are all part of what's called the Deep Space Network. Uh, there were three stations around the world, in Australia, Europe, and in the United States, to handle signals coming in. And then they're sent on here to NASA Ames for processing. They include not only the images that Larry showed you some of earlier, but all the data that's coming back from all 11 of the operating experiments on board. Some of those experiments also study light. Uh, they study it in order to look at the constituent gases in the atmosphere of Saturn and also to probe down through the atmosphere at the interior and surface of Saturn. One of the things that intrigues scientists about the planet Saturn is like Jupiter is what's called a gas giant. It is a very small, relatively small core, rocky core, that's only about 15 to 20 times the mass of planet Earth. All the rest of the planet we call Saturn is gas. It's a mix of hydrogen and helium gas, and scientists are studying the bands and the motions in that gas to try to get an idea of how that atmosphere circulates. Uh, coming out the other side of the planet now, uh, we have another view of Saturn in cross-light, with the sun uh, uh, lighting the planet from the side. A minute and a half now from the receipt of telemetry in the second ring crossing. 4 seconds. We're through the time. The telemetry uh, uh, continues to look good. Four minutes now uh, after the uh, uh, nominal time. Pioneer Saturn seems to be safely through the ring plane and still in business. The spacecraft is now 760,000 miles away from Saturn and uh, moving away at about 25,400 miles per hour. Uh, yesterday uh, we uh, in, during a press briefing yesterday afternoon, uh, some of the findings from yesterday's encounter at uh, Saturn were announced. These include the possibility of the discovery of a new moon at Saturn, also the discovery of a new ring, and the so-called Pioneer Division, or perhaps the Pioneer Gap, uh, between this new ring and the outside of the A-ring which is the outermost uh, ring which is visible through Earth telescopes. We also announced major structural features uh, have been discovered in the Saturn's atmosphere uh, and also made the first ever temperature measurements of Saturn's rings. I think we can say that our eclipse data, just as we go behind the planet, just at the end on the right there, are consistent with other analyses that imply that the rings are uh, centimeters size. And uh, the preliminary indications are that the uh, masses are not high, that uh, they are more consistent with uh, the uh, uh, hypothesis of the rings being made of ices rather than something heavy uh, containing a lot of iron. And then we come to this exquisite fine feature uh, the F ring, a very narrow F ring, which lies near or on the inside of the E ring, which we have not been able to observe, uh, but I have little doubt that the E ring exists. And then this morning we heard then of the discovery of the G ring uh, between approximately 10 and 15 uh, radii. On the planet itself, I think we've at least confirmed that. These yellow bands are correlated with cloud heights. From the bulk density of the planet, the fact that it's only seven-tenths the density of water, 
We know that it's largely made of hydrogen, but there's a little bit of heavy stuff, and it's close enough to be, um, the, the extra stuff you need is rather close to what you'd get if you just took solar material. On Voyager, we heard a lot of, uh, or some, speculation about <clears throat> organic molecules and uh, the possibility that within the clouds there's a belt or a zone or something where the temperature is comfortable for life. There almost certainly is a zone as you go down where the temperatures are um, comfortable uh, for life. And even the mixture of elements is probably adequate for life. There's carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, etc., etc. Um, of course, there's no solid surface for the life to cling to, and uh, there are convection currents carrying these molecules. If there are any molecules down there, and there certainly are. If there are any organic molecules, we don't know, but uh, let's assume there's a accidental organic molecule, uh, it will soon be carried to some zone, probably deeper, where it's much hotter and uh, where the molecule is dissociated. So I don't uh, hold much chance for floating organisms in either of these planets. We have a, a figure of the uh, interior. Uh, this is built up by an inner core. Right, that inner core you see is uh, made up of molten rock and iron. Uh, this model that we show here is uh, essentially correct. Uh, it consists of about three Earth masses, but is of about the same size as the Earth. So we have a density of about uh, three times what we have in the Earth on a body of about the same size, made up of rock and iron, but uh, uh, higher density by about a factor of three because it's inside of Saturn. Uh, then we uh, have an outer core where uh, uh, substances of water, methane, and ammonia have settled out of the uh, upper regions of Saturn, formed a uh, outer core consisting of about nine Earth masses. And the boundary of that uh, outer core is about 23% uh, of the uh, total planetary radius. Then on top of that is the uh, metallic hydrogen region. The boundary of that uh, makes up about 58% of the radius. On top of that, a uh, liquid hydrogen region. And then on the very top, a uh, gaseous atmosphere, which we estimate to be about 300 kilometers deep. Saturn does indeed have a magnetic field, and, and we know what its properties are. And uh, to paraphrase, William Gilbert, who started this business originally back in the 1600s, might say Saturn is indeed a giant magnet. Maybe we can show, uh, call up the Titan image, or one of the Titan images from last night. It doesn't have a lot of uh, obvious features on it, I think you'll agree, but if you've heard the, the model builders talking, they haven't predicted a lot of obvious features. The other uh, thing to notice is that this is really raw data, the good news that Titan is the Titan is there, the bad news is that we barely saw it. We were counting on, first of all, twice as much data at the high telemetry rate. Secondly, we were counting on no data dropout, so we have a good deal less data and uh, we were counting on uh, lots of data in order to average it and beat down the noise. And I'd say we that the temperature Titan is 75 degrees Kelvin, plus or minus 5, which is about the temperature you'd expect for an object in equilibrium with the sun at that place in the solar system. We are not looking at the surface. We are looking at the cloud tops or some point high in the atmosphere, and we cannot say what the temperature of the surface is. Do I gather that based on the data that you did get back with, with Titan, there is not insufficient temperature data with respect to the surface to ascertain whether indeed there is an atmosphere that could be hospitable to some life form? I think there's plenty of other data, <coughs> Earth-based data, that tend to rule out the possibility of high surface temperatures and therefore rule out life. There's, but I'll leave the door open a crack 
And I will certainly agree with you, my data do not have much to say about the surface temperature. I'm a radio man. Uh, I, I'm kind of fascinated with uh, the radio system of uh, Pioneer and the DSN. And I'm very impressed by the fact that all of these data I received from a distance of just, what well, exactly uh, one billion miles. At this distance, uh, if you are transmitting 1,024 bits per second, at any given time, there are five and a half million of those bits strung between here and Saturn, tra traveling at a speed of light, five and a half million. And they're spaced 182 miles apart. Pioneer Saturn spacecraft is on its way out of the solar system, uh, but will be tracked for a number of years yet to come, returning valuable data on the interplanetary medium, the solar wind. In the early 1980s, NASA discovered that Pioneers 10 and 11 were both slowing down and drifting off course. The deceleration became known as the Pioneer Anomaly. The Pioneer Anomaly was announced to the public in 1998 in the hope that someone may discover its cause. The most likely cause seemed to be thermal radiation, but no one was quite sure. In 2012, there was finally enough evidence to conclude that the Pioneer Anomaly was due to a force created by the probe's thermal radiation. Pioneers, first to brave this land of giants, first to fly forever among the lonely and endless stars of our galaxy, carry mankind's message. We're on our way. The cost of a planetary mission I like to measure in units of a beer. We all know what a beer costs, we all know what a beer means to us. The trip we're going to do to Saturn now is a real cheapie. We got two flybys of Jupiter by Pioneer and now one of Saturn for two cans of beer per person. <laughs> now that's cheaper than by a long shot than the cost of going to a movie today. And I can't help thinking that's worth it, do you agree? 